Welcome to Johannine Literature, Week 8, John 15 to 17. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time as we study your word, as we study the important words of Jesus' last discourse in John 15 to 17. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give us special guidance as we examine this portion of your word. Open our minds and hearts to learn more from you. In Jesus' name, amen. This week, we are going to conclude the discussion of the Johannine uh, Last Discourse. There is certainly a great deal here that is of importance for not only our understanding of the Gospel of John, but for our Christian life. And while we only have a limited amount of time here, I hope that this will pr uh, provide a, an encouragement to go into this material in more detail as we study the scripture and as you study the uh, Gospel of John and the Johannine literature on your own. Let us now begin. The last discourse continues in John 15 to 17. The relationship to what precedes, however, is difficult to um, assess. That is, how does 15 and 17 relate to what goes on before? This is because in 1431b, as we saw last week, Jesus said, arise, let us go from here, or let us go from here, as some uh, translations have it. Some say, let us go to another place. The in implication is the disciples and Jesus are on their way out of the room to the garden where Jesus will be betrayed. But that does not occur until chapter 18. The discourse of 1517 still pre presupposes that the supper discourse is concluding in the room of the supper. In other words, it presupposes the same setting we have in the discourse from chapters 13 and 14. For this reason, Barrett noted that some see the language as Eucharistic, particularly in chapter 15, the uh, metaphor of the vine and the branches. Uh, this is a traditional image for Israel, however, and so Barrett and others think this view is incorrect. For example, although there's a reference to the vine and branches, there is no reference to the bread and cup. Rather, the focus is abiding in Jesus. How do we explain the relationship between 1431b and 15 to 17? Boltmann rearranged the last discourse. He thought that chapter 17 followed 1320, that John 15 to 16 followed 1331 to 35, and John 14 concludes the last discourse. Now, this makes a lot of sense to a 20th century author. It, it doesn't necessarily follow what John is trying to do, however. Brown attributed the position of chapters 15 to 17, however, to a, redact to a redactor as well, but he concluded that this did not make the material less ancient. In other words, it is still uh, from a gospel source. And furthermore, we don't know who the redactor was. Was it John? Was it someone else? Ashton includes, in fact, if one accepts, as Lindars does, that chapter 15, origi originally a quite separate homily, has been tacked on to it, that is chapter 14, late, perhaps by the evangelist himself, perhaps by a subsequent redactor, then it is easy to see that the love commandment in 1334 has the same provenance as chapter 15. In other words, according to Ashton, um, chapter 1334 and 15 are thematically similar. But do we need to rearrange the structure of the Gospel of John to make sense of this? It is possible that the Gospel of John went through several editions, as Brown mentions, and we do have insertions in chapters 5 and 8. In chapter 5, with the discussion of the angel that comes down to the pool of Bethlehem. In chapter 759 to 811, of course, you have the uh, story of the woman taken in adultery, uh, which we did not discuss, and it's not really part of John. Yet, ultimately, we only have the gospel in its final form. At the same time, in preaching, we usually work with pericopes or small sections. Even if chapter 15 does come from the same level of tradition as 1334, 
This information only informs us that John 15 and 1334 have common themes. These themes are ones that can inform our preaching and teaching as we now explore the meaning of John 15. In 15, one, it begins with, I am the true vine, another ego a me. I ego a me, hey, I'm, hey, I'm Paulos, hey, Alethin. Alethine, Alethine. Okay. Ego a me, hey, I'm, Ampelos, hey, Alicine, Kai Hapatemu, a Gerogorosisti. I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. There is very little agreement about scholars, about any, among scholars, about anything in John 15, but one of these theories is that John 15, 1 to 17, constitutes constitutes a discourse unit. Can you see John 15, 1 to 17 as an allegory? Now, this conclusion disagrees with earlier research to, such as Euliker's um, in Dreykness Reden Yesu, never translated into English, but also disagrees with Dodd's uh, uh, Parables of the Kingdom, uh, Jeremias's Parables of Jesus, which concludes that Jesus' parables are not oracles. Are not parable, are not parables, are not are not allegories. On the other hand, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find allegories that allegories were at home just as much in Palestine as they were with Philo of Alexandria. Uh, Euliker, incidentally, based his assumption that the parables were not allegories on rabbinic parables, but these were from a much later period. So, if we look at more contemporary material from the time of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that uh, allegories were at home in Palestine, although they took a slightly different form, a form in which the uh, 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 metaphor of the vine and the branches is quite at home. With 15.1, we, we encounter another I am statement. Jesus announced that he's the true or the real vine, in 15, 1 to 17, the Johannine Jesus then appropriates a common biblical Old Testament imagery and applies it to himself. The biblical precedence for the image of the vine includes Psalms uh, 80, 8 to 16, Isaiah 27, 2 to 6, Jeremiah uh, 2, 21, Ezekiel 15, 2 to 6, and 17, 5 to 10, and 19, 10 to 15. These all see Israel as the vine. This is also seen in Isaiah 5, 1 to 7, where, Jesus, where Israel is the uh, vineyard of the Lord. You might also want to look at the parable of the wicked tenants in uh, Mark 12, uh, 1 to 12, which also reflects uh, Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. So we see that the uh, imagery of the um, Israel as the vine was very common, but now Jesus is applying this to himself. So in Jesus, we have the fulfillment of the prophecies originally uh, aimed at Israel. Manny thinks John 15, 1 to 17, specifically alludes to Ezekiel 15. In particularly, particular, he notes how in 15, uh, 6, the branch does not abide, that does not abide in Jesus will be cut off, cast into the fire, and burned, as we see in Ezekiel 15, 4 to 6 and 15, 8. John 15 shares broad themes with Ezekiel's vine imagery. Images. John's judgment of the fruitless branches has strong verbal parallels with the judgment on Jerusalem, and the themes that the two and the themes of the two images resonate as well. The main point of Ezekiel 15 is that the faithfulness of Jerusalem, Ezekiel 15a, faithlessness of Jerusalem, 15, Isaiah, Ezekiel 15a, has resulted in worthlessness and therefore judgment. In John 15, the judged branches failed to abide in Jesus' faithfulness and thus produced no fruit, worthlessness, and are judged. Likewise, Robert Schenck in Life in the Sun, 
understood the judgment theme of John 15 as scriptural evidence against the Calvinist doctrine of perseverance. Now, while there's certainly an uh, uh, emphasis to remain in Christ, what does that really mean? Again, we have to remember not to impose some of our um, controversies onto Scripture. Uh, John is not interested in um, Calvinist versus Arminian uh, controversies. So is it only fellowship or that is referred to here? Is it only fellowship with Jesus, or do we have a reference to the need to remain in the community of faith? How might the interpret this imagery also be interpreted, for example, in 1 John? John 1, 15, 1 makes two points. Jesus is the true vine. Jesus' father is the vine dresser. Again, we see the imagery of Israel as the vineyard of the Lord, and the vine imagery is inherited from Judaism and refers to early Christians' strong sense of community. In uh, Isaiah 5, 1 to 10 or 5, 1 to 7, the vineyard of the Lord does not produce useful fruit. But as Thompson also notes, Isaiah 27, 2 to 6 and, and 60, uh, 12, there was also an expectation that the vineyard would uh, uh, produce abundant fruit. In short, the vine imagery refers to the nurture of God's community. In 15, 2 to 3, the reader is reminded of the father's task as vine dresser or gardener. He cuts out the vine that does not, or the branches that did not bear fruit. He trims and prunes or cleanses, catharis, cather, Catharizo, in order that it should bear more fruit. How does one bear fruit? And incidentally, it's not the emphasis on you bearing fruit, but remaining in the vine. So this is not necessarily a demand for evangelism. Rather, bearing fruit is defined in verse 3. Disciples are clean through Jesus' word, which is the logos, which here refers to the context of Jesus' full teaching. So let's look at 15.3. Already you are clean on account of the word which I have spoken, the lalika, the lalika, who mean to you. Menata in amoi, kago in who mean, kathos ta plema, u dunatai, parpon, fairing, af autu, on me. Many in a umpello. So already you are clean on account of the word which I have spoken. Remain in me, and I in you, just as the the, the, bre the branch is not able to bear fruit from itself, except it should remain in the vine. Incidentally, the term meno or remain is going to be a very important term throughout this discourse, and particularly throughout this metaphor. So how does Jesus cause the dis teaching cause the disciples to bear fruit? He sees this as moral fruit. Manning sees a contrast between the community of Jesus and the Jerusalem leadership, just as, in Ezekiel, just as Ezekiel is condemning the Jerusalem leadership of his day in Ezekiel 15, 17, and 19. In Ezekiel, the three vine metaphors announce judgment against Jerusalem and its leaders. This is perhaps one reason for John's appropriation of Ezekiel's metaphors. Conflict with Jerusalem and its leaders is one of the driving themes of John. Judas is an example of one who places his trust in a false vine, the Jerusalem council. Jesus' parable of the True Vine explains the betrayal of Judas and exhorts disciples to trust only in Jesus. This is from Manning's book, Echoes of a Prophet. So there is the necessity to remain in the true vine, in the true community. The, sol the solution is likely a combination of what Keener and Manning say. The exhortation to remain, Manning, is repeated three times in John 15:4. First, we find the imperative remain. Then the subjunctive notes that unless a vine should 
unless a branch should remain in the vine, it cannot bear fruit. So the disciples cannot bear fruit unless they should remain subjunctive in Jesus. The disciples remain in Jesus through their intimate relationship with him, which is confirmed by the paraclete. So, just as a branch cannot bear fruit unless it remains in the vine, so the disciples must remain in Jesus. And the fact it's repeated three times tells us how important the concept of remaining is. The disciples also remain or abide in Jesus, or to remain or abide in Jesus. And to remain in Jesus means one remains in the community of faith. Abiding then has both communal and personal dimension. The communal aspect is reinforced in 1 John, as we'll see in 1 John 1, 3, and 2, 9 to 11, and 3, 11 to 12. The importance of remaining is reiterated in 15, 5. On, again, only by remaining or abiding in Jesus can one bear fruit. While abiding involves faithful following or discipleship, it also envisions a union of disciples with the risen Lord that can no longer be described in the physical act of following, it undoubtedly reflects early Christian experience. 15.6 describes the consequences of not following Jesus or not abiding in Jesus. The opposite of following or abiding in Jesus is apostasy. In 1 John, those who leave the community and who do not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh are called antichrists. Here, the one who does not abide in Jesus is like a dead branch. It's cast out and burned. As the apostate leadership of Israel was rejected, so we find a serious warning against apostasy here. But the Johannine Jesus does not leave us in despair. The counterpoint to apostasy is faithfulness and its fruits, as are mentioned in 15, 7 to 8. As we come to a transition in 15, 7, the vine imagery is abandoned. How this section is to be divided is a point of some contention. Uh, Kenya connects verse 7 to 15.6. Brown, on the other hand, sees a chiastic relationship between 15.7 to 10 and 15.12 to 18, with 15.11 being the transitional crux in the chiasm. Brown understands that 15.1 to 6 is a, the metaphor, or as Brown prefers, the mashal, which could mean a metaphor, a parable, a, a proverb originally belonged to a different context. In 15.7 to 17, the theme of the last discourse are again uh, uh, taken up, but they are informed by the mashal. In contrast to the warning of, of failure to remain is the promise of those who remain in the vine, that is Jesus. If you remain in me, on, used with the subjunctive, is a conditional sentence. If the believer remains in me, and my words should remain in you, subjunctive, the, and incidentally the word term word is rhema, but again we should not make too much of this. Instead what we see in 15.7 is Jesus is present not only in his physical appearance, but in his words as well. Where do the words abide? They abide in the community of faith not just in the individual believer, but certainly in the individual believer also. In 1517b, uh, uh, or 157b, we have the second part of the conditional sentence. If you abide in me, in my, and my words abide in you, in 157b, you will ask what you will. See 1413. As mentioned last week, this is not a promise of prosperity. Rather, it is intimately connected with Jesus' words or commands. In particularly, it is related to the love command. In 15.8, we see the purpose we're asking. As we have said, in 15.8 to 17, there's a new subdivision, um, which the, where the focus is the love command. The, the, so the uh, focus so this focuses on the low command. Brown sees uh, verse 8 as the second component of 15.7 to 17. Either way, we 
what we see is how to remain abiding in Jesus. The true branch is being defined. It is defined as being in intimate relationship with Jesus and the Father and bearing fruit. The purpose of prayer, the purpose of bearing fruit, is to glorify the Father and that we be Jesus' disciples. Bearing fruit is defined in 15, 9 to 10. Just as the Father loved me and I love you, remain in my life. See 15, 15. And also John, uh, 1 John 4, 11 to 16a. Remaining in the law and love also means remaining in Jesus' commandments, as Jesus remained in the Father's commandments. Jesus kept the Father's commandments and remains in the Father's love, as we see in uh, 8.29.14.21. Also, when you look at John, 1 John 4.2 and 7, and also 1 John 3.17 to 18, there's the importance of remaining in community and remaining in love. In particular, verse 10 associates love commandment, an association already encountered in 1334, 1415, 21, 23, and 24. This is what Brown points out in his comment. Jesus' uh, command is rooted in love, in the Father's love, and keeping the commandments. So Jesus' command is rooted in the Father's love and keeping the commandments. Schnackenberg notes how, for example, verses 4 to 8, 9 to 10 form a rhetorical unit. The, the unit is connected to the two Kathos uh, clauses. Just as the Father loved me, I have kept, and I, just as I have kept the Father's uh, commandment. These two clauses are arranged chiastically with the admonition to abide in Jesus' love in the middle. The appeal is the real aim of the statement and the uh, and, give it, and gives depth to the admonition, abide in me. In 15.11, we find a summary, which both concludes 15.7-10 and introduces 15.17. The purpose of what Jesus has said Note the perfect tense, Jesus has spoken, but the words still have meaning. Is this a reference again to the community hearing Jesus' words? Is that the disciples have joy? It also is that Jesus' own joy may be fulfilled. And in 1 John 1, 4, the joy is understood as in the context of community life together. Is 1 John again a commentary on this passage? In 15, 12 to 15, we see that Jesus' words are directed to his disciples now as friends. Now, Keener has an extended discussion of friendship in the ancient world, which we do not have time to go into here. But he concludes that the subordination of the disciples in obedience is probably more an expression of covenant loyalty qualified by the continuing role of serving disciples than subordination of a client to a patron. The disciples are clearly dependent on Jesus in 15.1-7, and that dependence may have been read, read by clients patronly, but need not have been so understood. Rather, Jesus shares the secrets of his heart with his disciples, treating them as friends, as God treated Abraham and Moses. The parallels with John 16.13-15 indicate that the spirit of truth would continue passing down the revelation from the Father uh, and Jesus to the disciples. So, at the same time that we are in covenant relationship and uh, uh, required obedience, we are also sharers of God's intimate secrets. That's what Jesus is saying to the disciples. But what does friendship mean? Um, First of all, it provides the basis for uh, keeping the commandments. In 15.12, we have a repetition of the love command against the 13.34 and 35 directed towards the community. The reason is that the disciples have the example of Jesus, who gave his life for his friends. Now, 
friendship in the Greco-Roman world was also a very formalized relationship with specific obligations. A friend was supposed to advance the cause of the patron or client, such as friends of the king. Um, this is received from Second Maccabees, can be a formal title. Now, Abraham was a friend of God, as we see in Isaiah 41.8 and Second Chronicles of 27.7-7. But in Genesis 18, especially 22-23, we see how Abraham acts as a friend when he is negotiating with God. Moses also does the same thing in Exodus 33-11. Uh, a friend was not only to flatter, but tell the friend hard truths. Plutarch says this in How to Tell a Flatterer from a Friend. To be God's friend means one can appeal to God. Now, this is an idea that a lot of us don't really understand. We can appeal to God's character. It entails also obedience, as exemplified by Jesus laying down his life for his friends. Incidentally, when we talk about being a friend of God today, do we talk about obedience and laying down our lives for other believers? Just a thought. But the life of a friend is not one of mindless obedience, as we see in 1515. Unlike a servant or slave, the friend knows the companion's works. The slave does not know what the master does, because the disciples are being, thus the disciples are being informed about Jesus' impending fate. Slaves were not drawn to the confidence of masters, and this is also applied to Abraham elsewhere uh, in Philo uh, in the migration of Abraham. Uh, and incidentally, again, the idea that Abraham was taken into God's confidence. Uh, in fact, in uh, Genesis 18, God specifically says, will I tell Abraham what I am about to do, or I'm about to make him a great nation? As Brown points out, while believers remain douloi, or, or slaves, with regard to obedience, they are more than douloi because their intimate relationship with Jesus and the Father they are also philoi, or friends. Jesus has made known to his disciples all the things he has heard from the Father. If Jesus' act of love and dying for them has made the disciples his beloved, the same effectiveness may be attributed to his word, which he has received from the Father. Notice once more the intimate relation between Jesus' deed and word. The basis for friendship is found in 15, 16, and 17. As Abraham and Moses were called by God and became God's friends, so uh, the disciples were chosen by Jesus. They are called to bear fruit in 15, 1 to 6, and 7 to 10. In this context, they asked for the Father in Jesus' name. In 15, 17, what it means to bear fruit is specified. It is to keep Jesus' command which is the love command. Again, I'm not saying that we should neglect evangelism. It is important. But here the focus is life within the context of Christian community, or since the term Christian was probably not yet used, within the context of the Johannine community. In 1518 to 16.4, we see the converse of the fathers and Jesus' love for the disciples described. If the, if the disciples are loved by God and loved by Jesus, that doesn't mean the world loves them. And quite the contrary, the world will hate them. The reason for this hatred is spelled out in 15, 15 18, because the world hated Jesus first. In Matthew, uh, you can see the same concept in Matthew 22, 25, 10, 22, and 25, and 1 John 3, 13. In Matthew 22, 20, 25, is the warning that the disciple is not above the master. If they call the master Beelzebul, so they'll call you. John's emphasis on the world's hatred, related to his own situation and outlook, probably stems from an authentic Jesus tradition. Both Jesus' teaching, and we see this in Mark 13, 12, Matthew 10, 5, 10 to 11, 10, 21, 25, 35, and 39, compare Luke, um, uh, 1640 and uh, 26, uh, uh, 14, 26 to 27, and his sacrificial death provides ample material for addressing the world's hostility. 
The world's hatred applies not only to Jesus' disciples, but also to John's own situation. It applies to John's readers. They also have experienced exclusion on account of their confession of Jesus as God's anointed. Their self-image is common with what we would find in groups that are sectarian, such as the perspective of the Essenes in the community role and in the war scroll. Note here that the term world here means those outside of the Johannine community, not the world as the object of God's love, as we see in John 3, 15 to 16. Keener reads um, 3, 15, 18 to 21 as a chiasm. If the world hates you, it hated me. If you are of the world, it would love you, but you are not. Because I chose you, the servant is no greater than the master. If they wrong me, they will persecute you. If they kept my words, they will keep yours. They will persecute you for Jesus and the Father's sake. Now this outline is not definitive, but it helps see the logic that the hatred of Jesus is also a hatred that the disciples are going to receive as well. Um, discipleship is not for those who wish to be the most popular person in the class. The reason for the world's hatred is explained in 1519. The disciples are not of the world. Jesus called the disciples out of the world, and so the world hates them. Now, what is hate? As we see in Thompson, page 332, the Greek has a connotations not found in English, where hate usually means intense feelings of hostility. Now, it can mean that, but uh, usually that's more like thumos, wrath. For John 15, 18 and 21, it refers to the refers, hatred refers to the referral, refusal of the world to follow Jesus and his disciple. And also that servants cannot expect better treatment than their masters. And finally, the ones who persecute the disciples will do so because they know neither the Father nor Jesus. Thus, the world's hate refers to the rejection both of Jesus' message and the message of the disciples as the bearers of that message. This fact is made plain in 1520. Those who persecuted Jesus will also persecute the disciples. And they would have kept Jesus' word. They'll accept yours as well. And the reason is found in 1521. They do these things because they do not know Jesus. They do not know the Father. For the Johannine author, there is no knowledge of the Father outside knowledge of Jesus, as we see in 14, 6, and 7. The culpability or guilt of the world is described again in 1522-24. The guilt of the world is confirmed by rejecting Jesus' words and deeds. Had Jesus not come speaking, the people of the world would have no sin, but now they have no pretext for their sin, as we see in 941, when uh, the Pharisees ask, "Do uh, we are not blind, are we? Jesus said, if you have... If you uh, said you were blind, you'd have no sin. But because you say you see, you we see, your sin remains. Indeed, hatred of Jesus is hatred of the Father. In 1524, uh, as we see in 1411, there's another appeal to Jesus' works. If Jesus came and had not done works that had not been by uh, any other, they'd have no sin. Or if Jesus had not come. But Jesus has come. And they hate Jesus and the Father. The hatred of the world, then, is not only something that is manifested in Jesus' ministry. This hatred refill, reflects the fulfillment of Scripture. In 35.19, and Psalm 7.1, 65.19—particularly, they hated me without cause. We see both the experience of Jesus and the later Johannine community reflected here, the experience of the community will be delineated more in 16.4, 1-4a. Again, the disciples, however, are not to despair. The community is to express its love to its members. How can it bear up? Because they have the gift of the paraclete in 26 and 27 of chapter 15. The Jesus will send the paraclete from the Father in 1527, who is the spirit of truth. That spirit is sent by Jesus 
from the Father, and this is a text that gave rise to the filioque, uh, I should say, filioque controversy in the early church. Does the Spirit only come from the Father or from the Son as well? Uh, or that is filioque and the Son. Now, filioque means and the Son in Latin. Filios is Son, K is the, the uh, um, uh, suffix there means and. The purpose of the paraclete then is in this third passage where the paraclete is mentioned is that he comes from the Father and he also witnesses to Jesus. This bearing witness is directed towards the world, which is why the disciples can endure. The bearing witness is conducted by the disciples, but then what will be the reception? And incidentally, this is why, as I said earlier, although the focus is on doing the works of the Father, that is, the moral attributes of uh, being a member of the community is what belief seems to be. At the same time, it does not neglect um, evangelism, because evangelism, now we see, is carried out in the power of the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit-bearing witness within the community. In 16.1-4a, the um, results of bearing witness are cl uh, clarified. As in Isaiah 6.11-13 and Jeremiah 1.10, there's no guarantee of a favorable reception. Indeed, if Isaiah and Jeremiah received uh, an equivocal re re reception, that's a reception that is uh, doubtful, that of the disciples is explicitly hostile. Jesus announces what will happen at the time, this, uh, ahead of time, so they will not have cause to stumble or fall away. Uh, scandal, you should not, in order that you should not fall away. Again, a subjunctive. We're here with a concept of purpose. They will be expelled from the synagogue. Again, this probably reflects the experience of the Johannine community. Those who kill the disciples will think they're offering a service of worship to God. Um, we see this in the experience of Saul of Tarsus, um, outlined in or described in Acts 8 and 9. For 13, um, 16, 3, you might want to look at 15, 21, and 23 to 24. Um, this is, again, a um, concept in the gospel that is reiterated here. And they do these things because uk egnosan atan patera uda ema. They did not know the Father, and they did not know me. Knowledge of Jesus is knowledge of God. The theme, again, is also applied to Jesus' followers. The action of the opponent is because they do not recognize uh, the Father, or they do not recognize Jesus. Thus, the disciples are going to share the, their master's fate, hatred by the world. In 16.4a, Jesus mentions that he's spoken these things, so when the hour comes, the disciple may remember these things. You see here a repetition of, um, of 16.1, such a repetition notes the importance of a theme. The persecution of the Johannine community was foretold by Jesus. Thus, Jesus' words are affirmed in the actions that they will um, endure. As is the status of the Johannine community as witness to God's work in Jesus and God's community of faith, um, that is the, uh, so the, uh, Words are reaffirmed because it is the status of uh, the community's witness to God's work in Jesus and as God's community of faith. This is the uh, reason they are opposed by their opposition. Therefore, the disciples, and by extension the Johannine community, will remember these words when the events occurs. In 16.4b-11, we have another passage of encouragement, which includes the fourth paraclete passage in 16.7 to 11. According to Schnackenberg, 16.4b uh, to 33 is a conciliatory discourse, which describes the activity of the paraclete 
and the joy and peace despite the coming distress. Um, the passage begins with 14b to, to 6. Jesus said, or 16.4b to 6. Jesus states, I have said these things from the beginning while I was with you. Again, we find that because the disciples were with him from the beginning, they are qualified to be witnesses. Uh, look again at 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. The statement of 4b leads to 5 to 7. Now Jesus goes to the one having sent me, active heiress participle. Um, we see in 16.5. And now I go to the one who has sent me. That is the uh, Pemsanta, the one having sent me. You see also 13.1, Jesus knows he's going to return to the Father. In 16.5, Jesus says, none of you ask where you are going. Yet in 13.36 and 14.5, we have precisely these questions. The point is, as we find out by looking closely at 16.5 to 6, the disciples are still thinking in earthly terms. They are unable to comprehend the full significance of Jesus' departure because they are only looking from a worldly perspective. Their misunderstanding has not been overcome. Jesus proceeds in 16.6. These things I have spoken, see again 16.1, with exactly the same phrase. Um, because he has spoken these things, the disciples are filled with grief, lupe, pain of mind, spirit, grief, sorrow, affliction. The sorrow is not to be misunderstood along the lines of psychology or fiction. On the contrary, it characterizes the situation of loneliness, which is the lot of those whom Jesus has called out of the world and against whom the hatred of the world is directed. Again, however, Jesus does not leave the disciples in sorrow. Jesus' departure is not a cause for sorrow in 16.7. On the one hand, the disciples are sorrowful. Yet it is to your advantage. Only upon Jesus' departure can he send the paraclete. We are not told why the paraclete is not available until Jesus sends him. We are only told that his presence is actually better for the disciples in the earthly presence of Jesus, for the par paraclete represents Jesus dynamically to the world in each hostile situation. In the work of the paraclete, we have seen earlier, he is the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive, teaches believers, he witnesses to Jesus, and now he has the pur purpose of reproof, a linking. Um, the idea is not only condemning, but convicting proving the fault of an opponent. The three areas of reproof are sin, righteousness, and judgment. In 16.9-11, we see the paraclete reproves the world based on how it responds to Jesus. On the one hand, this is a mendah construction. On the one hand, this happens. On the other hand, something else, typical of a mendah. On the one hand, they are convicted of sin because they do not believe in me. They are convicted of righteousness. Jesus goes to the Father concerning judgment, because the ruler, ruler of the world is judged. In Mark 3.27, in the parable of the binding of the strong person, the binding of Satan occurs in Jesus' ministry, manifested in Jesus' exorcism. In John, there are no exorcisms. And the judgment of Satan occurs at Jesus' glorification, the events of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. The paraclete does not only convict the world, however, the paraclete has a function within the church, as we see in verses 12 to 15. Look also in uh, 1426 and 1526 to 27. John 16, 7 to 11 and 12 to 15 are related. 7 to 11 describes the paraclete's activities toward the world. Now the focus in 12 to 15 is on the life of the church. In 1612, the disciples, and by extension the readers, are told that Jesus has much to say, but uh, 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 the, that uh, to the disciples, I should say, and extension to the readers, Jesus has much to say to them, but they cannot bear it. That is, in 1612, Jesus has much to say to the disciples, and by extension to the uh, readers. Um, 
it is the duty of the Spirit to continue to lead the disciples in all truth, and this is the point of verse 13. So, while Jesus much to say to the disciples and to the readers, this point again is made in verse 13, and this is one of the reasons why many scholars have thought that the early, in the early church, the words of Christian prophets were ascribed to Jesus. Uh, 13, and, we, and when, um, when that one, or when he should come, the spirit of truth, he will lead you in, uh, in te elethe passe, or in te elethe passe, uh, that is in all truth, for he does not speak from himself, but which things he, um, he heard, he speaks, and um, the, thing, the things coming about he will announce to you. This view especially applied to John, since in many places, such as John 3, we cannot tell where the words of Jesus end and those of the narrator begin. Because the Spirit does not speak from himself, the statement affirms that the word uh, that is at work in the community is the word of revelation and not human discourse. That is, it is the word that Jesus spoke. Yet while it is true that prophetic spirit remains in the community, it may be going too far to assume that in the early church there was no differentiation between the words of Jesus, between that word, the word of the community, and the words of Jesus. Look, for example, at 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul specifically says, this is what the Lord says, and this is what I say. Uh, look at again at Balcom, Jesus, and the Witnesses. Rather, we see the continuing presence of Jesus in the community of faith, where the Spirit speaks, particularly addressing issues that Jesus himself may not have. In short, in the most individualistic of Gospels, the focus is still on the Holy Spirit's, the paraclete's, function within the community of faith. And for this reason, um, we in 1 John, an exit from the community, it means a separation from God, as we shall see. In 16, 14, and 15, the purpose of the paraclete is further described. The Spirit glorifies Jesus. This is because what he receives from Jesus, he announces to them. Again, we do not have a developed, fully developed Trinitarian theology. However, or pneumatology perhaps, we do have, see that the Spirit announces what he receives from Jesus. Likewise, all that is from the uh, from the fathers, uh, all that is from the fathers is also of Jesus. And what the Spirit receives from Jesus, he will announce. Jesus' words then, ultimately, are words of the Father. In 16, 16 to 18, the disciples continue to misunderstand Jesus. In 1616, Jesus says that in a short time you will not see me. As the crowds in 733 to 36 and 822, so now the disciples do not understand what Jesus is meaning. The misunderstanding leads to a dispute among the disciples, which leads to the explanation of 1619 to 28. Again, we see where misunderstanding leads to further explanation. In 1619, Jesus begins the final stage of his discourse, which will be concluded by the prayer in John 17. In 1619, Jesus knows the dispute. You can also see where in 66, where Jesus knew what he was going to do when he asked uh, Philip what to, how he defeated this crowd. Also, see Mark 9, 20, 33, where Jesus knows that the disciples were debating who was the greatest. The we see a common theme that Jesus is able to discern the thoughts of those around him. And this leads to the opportunity to clarify the dispute. 
So we see that uh, um, in 1619, Jesus begins the final stage of the dis the, his discourse. In 1620 to 22, Jesus gives further explanation. In 20, there's a word, the contrast between the response of Jesus' disciples and the world. The disciples will be sorrowful again. They're going to experience lupe because Jesus will depart. The world, on the other hand, will rejoice. The, word ex uh, the world experiences joy, kara, just as the disciples will experience it and apparently arrive. And here's the contrast. Joy for the world is absent of Jesus, while joy for the disciples is his presence, either physically or through the presence of the Holy Spirit. This thought is made clear in 1621. In 1621, you find the metaphor of the woman giving birth. The metaphor comes very close to being a parable, but still functions differently. This is not the story of a particular woman giving birth, such as we see in the sower. It's closer to the parable of the mustard seed, where we have a comparison. And Stackenberg indeed calls it a parable. The comparison, though, is of the eschatological age uh, to a woman of the uh, comparison of the uh, eschatological age to a woman giving birth. And this is a common analogy, as you see in Revelation uh, 12, 2, and 5. Here, however, there's a difference between the way the analogy is used elsewhere. In Mark 13, 8, the analogy of birth pains refers to the eschatological future, to the events before Jesus' parousia to the events before the coming of the Son of Man. Now the analogy is applied to the upcoming events of Jesus' passion and resurrection. As the woman experiences Lupe when she gives birth, something often equated with death in Judaism, as Kinger notes, so the disciples will encounter the same kind of intense pain. But when they see Jesus again, they'll have joy, a joy that cannot be taken away. Compare, again, um, 14 uh, 27, the peace that Jesus leads with his disciples. One of the results of Jesus' passion and resurrection is found in 1623 to 24. They will no longer make requests of Jesus. They will ask the Father in Jesus' name. Now, in Matthew 7 7, Jesus admonishes listeners to ask and they will receive. Here we have a promise again, as we see in 14 13, that the purpose of asking the Father and so the disciples may have joy, or Jesus speaks, and notice that where Jesus speaks to in 1511, um, the disciples have joy as well. Jesus now states in 1625 to 33 that he has spoken up to this point in, in uh, parameis, in, in metaphors and figures of speech. Later, Jesus will intercede in their behalf because the Father loves the disciples, and the disciples have loved and believed in Jesus. The Philos family is used here again, but this is again Johannai love for alternating words. And the word love there was not meant to be uh, um, uh, how should we put this, facetious or anything, but it certainly does seem to <laughs> benefit the uh, 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 context of how we've been speaking. Jesus also announces that he's coming to the world, but now he is leaving it. The disciples announce they fully understand Jesus. They say he is no longer speaking figurative language. They understand him. We know that you know all things. They believe that he's come from God. But this belief is the same belief that Nicodemus in 3 1 and Martha in chapter 11 have. They believe Jesus comes from God but they do not understand what that actually means. They are expressing confidence, similar to Peter's in 1336, where I will give my life for you. And then what we find is that uh, Peter will fail. In 1331 to 33, more Johannine irony. You Do you believe? They will, in fact, be scattered. But Jesus has spoken these things so they can have peace. If the world, um, 
if in, in the world they'll have persecution, but Jesus has overcome the world. See 1 John 5, 4. Jesus again directly addresses his disciples, but the Johannine Jesus also addresses the community, affirming his final victory. Just as Jesus had victory, so they will have victory themselves, the perfect victory. The victory is promised also in Jesus' prayer in John 17. This is the longest of Jesus' prayers for which we have a record. We do have records that Jesus would rise early and pray in Mark 135, but very seldom are Jesus' words recorded, although uh, they are recorded in the Sermon on the Mount uh, and, in, uh, where, and in the Lord's Prayer. It seems Jesus' prayer time was usually private. However, we do see, uh, however, here we see Jesus' prayer for his disciples. Again, it's not only directed to the disciples, it is also directed to the community, as we see in beginning in 6, 1720, perhaps, and as we will see in our further discussion, we will say that it extends to 1726. Brown structures uh, John 17 as follows. 17, 1 to 5. Jesus asks for glory. 17, 6 to 8, Jesus, a work of revelation among his disciples. In 17, 9 to 19, Jesus prays for those whom the Father has given him. In 17, 20 to 26, Jesus prays for those who believe through the disciples. Now, others divide the chapter differently. Stackenberg, for example, divides 17, 6 to 19, that's 17, 6 to 11, A, 17, 11, B to 16, and 17, 17 to 19. The specifics are not important just as we look at the context or the content. Jesus begins his prayer in typical fashion. He lifts his eyes up to heaven, as we see in the parable of the uh, uh, Pharisee and the publican. Um, incidentally, the idea of praying with your hands folded and your head down actually comes from the high middle ages and it comes from the investiture of a night that that ceremony in John 17 1 to 8 we have Jesus prayer it opens with father and from uh, Matthew 6 9 which is parallel to 11 2 we see that Jesus commonly addressed God as father in prayer also in 1436 we see that Jesus uh, uh, prayers addressed God as Abba or father but we also need to recognize that in other Jewish prayers God was also addressed as Father. And also because Jesus uses Abba, it does not mean Daddy. It does not mean, um, as Jeremias thought, it's a special re uh, relationship. Look at James Barr, Abba is Daddy in General Theological Studies, the new series, uh, 1988. Jesus now acknowledges it is the hour, C13.1, and ask the Father to glorify your Son and order your Son to glorify you. We see this also in 1228 and 739, where Jesus speaks of the glorified, where the speaks of the Spirit, which was not yet because Jesus was not yet glorified. Glorification, again, refers to Jesus carrying passion, crucifixion, and resurrection. One thing to note in the prayer is its triumphant, the triumphant Jesus, who goes who does not undergo the agony of Gethsemane. The agony talks is probably more in chapter 12, where Jesus says, my soul is distressed, to is distressed, Lupe again, uh, but uh, what should I pray to uh, deliver me from this hour? But Father, glorify your name. And then you have the voice from heaven, as we discussed in uh, we discussed chapter 12 a couple weeks ago. The prayer concludes the last discourse, which, contrary to Boltman, rearranges so the prayer uh, precedes 14 to 16, and presents Jesus, uh, and this prayer also uh, presents Jesus, uh, Jesus, whose final concern is for his disciples, for whom he now prays. In 17, 2 to 5, Jesus describes his work. First, authority has been given from the Father over all flesh, and this authority the Father has given to Jesus. See 1, 12 to 13. See also 5, 19, where Jesus does what the Father shows him. 
So now the authority is to uh, give the disciples eternal life. As we see in 5.4, the fundamental orientation of the life of Jesus was to complete the task given to him by the Father. Jesus' mission, unlike that in the Synoptic Gospels, is not the initiation of the kingdom of God, but it is eternal life, which is defined in 17.3, that all should know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sinned, which is an interesting way of putting this in a context of a prayer, which is one reason people see words of the of Johannine theology um, among Jesus' words in the prayer. Again, for John, there is no knowledge of God, without knowledge and acknowledgement of Jesus. Only by knowing Jesus does one know God. The reason is Jesus has accomplished the task. He has glorified God upon the earth, which includes all of Jesus' work, up to and including, again, the passion, death, and resurrection. All of Jesus' work is concluded, is included in this aorist, which looks at a comprehensive or completed whole, as we see in 17.4. And I glorify you upon the earth, uh, having completed the work you had, um, having completed the work which you gave to me, uh, which you gave me in order I should do it, or that you had given to me in order that I should do. All of, so we see here the perspective of the community. Jesus has completed. Uh, teleosus, uh, or has uh, perfected that work. It's teleo means to teleo means to complete or to finish. That work was given to Jesus. Jesus has now accomplished it. In 1715, or 75, Jesus describes his glory. It is to accomplish the task of the Father. To, uh, to, to, that to accomplish his task, rather. Uh, Jesus asked the Father to glorify Jesus with the glory you had. Um, with the glory that he had in the, the glory that ensured that Jesus had the Father's presence, which he had before the world was. The syntax is difficult, but the meaning is clear. Jesus shares the Father's glory and shared it from the beginning. As in 17.2, we see a reference to the prologue. In 17.6-8, Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. But Jesus reveals himself, not just himself, he reveals your name to those whom you gave to me. These are the ones to whom God's word has been entrusted. They are those who have kept your word. They have kept the word because they know that God has given them all things, and they know that Jesus has come from God. They believe that the Father has sent the Son, since Jesus bears the name of God, they know, as with Moses, that he has been, that he has, uh, been sent by God. Jesus is thus the prophet like Moses. In 1919 of 17, Jesus prays for those whom the Father has entrusted him. In 17.9, Jesus specifically uh, does not pray for the world. This again, contrary to 3.15-16. The point is that as God has been faithful to Jesus, so God might also be faithful to those entrusted to Jesus. This point is made in 17.10. All things are both the God's and the Father, and God's and Jesus, as I can say. Although this expression is neuter, it seems that Jesus is praying explicitly for the disciples. These are those to whom we got... Uh, whom God has entrusted to Jesus, for one cannot come to Jesus, to Jesus unless God draws that person. In 1711, Jesus prays for the unity of the disciples. This unity derives to the fact that, like Jesus, they are not of the world. Jesus is coming to the Father, but that is through the way of the cross. From their point of view, the Lord is the midstream, so to speak. 
But Jesus appeals to the Father, whom he addressed here as holy. It is the Father who is holy who guards Jesus' followers. And because and holiness here means separation, but it also means that uh, in the biblical sense that you are separated to God and therefore you share God's character, which then, because God is is a uh, a moral God, a God of virtue, it is a moral and virtuous holiness. The result is that they should be like Jesus and should be kept uh, in the name the Father gave to Jesus. In 1712, we find that Jesus has been faithful to God's work. A new community has been founded, and Jesus has pres preserved it, except for the son of destruction. Again, the reference is here to Judas, and indicates that his fate was predicted by Scripture. At the same time, what do these words mean for the Johannine community? Is it saying that if they desert the community, they will also share the fate of Judas? Is their fate also predicted in Scripture if they desert the community? But we need not. But we also need to maintain focus on the main point: Jesus preserved those who believe in Him. But now Jesus is coming to the Father, and the purpose is that my joy might be fulfilled in them. You might want to look again at 14, 16, and 17, and 26. The joy come. The joy that comes belongs to Jesus. These things, again, are a tauta is a, an indication of the whole message of Jesus, which is a logos that Jesus has given to them, the dis, uh, disciples, which for re this reason the world hates them, you see in 15, 18, 19, because like Jesus, his disciples are not of the world. Yet while the disciples are not of the world, Jesus does not ask that the Father take them out of the world. This is because believers share the character of Jesus and are hated by the world. They also share his mission to the world. Thus they are not of the world, just as Jesus is not. Instead, they are to share in God's character, which is holiness. For this reason, Jesus prays that the followers be sanctified. His followers be sanctified in your truth. Sanctified means to share the holy character of God, which is mentioned in 1711. They are recipients of the full revelation of God, full of grace and truth, as we see in 114. In 18 and 19, it makes clear what we've just observed. As the Father sent Jesus into the world, Jesus now sends the disciples. They are not of the world. But they have a mission to it. Likewise, it is for their sake that Jesus has sanctified or separated himself for service. Again, the Hagias root, the reason is believers might be sanctified in truth. In 17, as in 1717. Um, in summary, most of all, the disciples would be set apart like Jesus, who is concentrated, consecrated wholly. For the Father's purpose. Pursuing holy the agenda from above, alien to the world. Jesus' word had set the disciples apart and cleansed them in practice. Jesus John may allude to Jesus himself, compare 1 1 to 18, as well as the spoken words as the message through which God would set them um, more fully. In 20 to 23, the focus shifts. It is no longer Jesus' immediate disciples that Jesus is praying for, but those believing through their word. The purpose here of Jesus' prayer is twofold. First, it's a prayer of unity. Unity is bestowed uh, by the glory given by Jesus uh, to Jesus by the Father. The goal is perfect unity, that they may be one as we are one. Second, is that that unity, through that unity, the world may know that the Father sent Jesus and loved and loved the, the disciples and Jesus' followers. So the second is that the, the uh, world may know that Jesus has sent the Father and he has loved them, those who are from Jesus' followers. Thus unity is not a goal in and of itself, 
The goal is that Jesus and the Father may be glorified, that the world should understand that the body of believers is the community in which God's love abides. Does this presuppose that there is conflict in the community? Certainly, such a conflict is addressed in uh, 1 John. And if it is a conflict in the community that uh, John is being concerned with, certainly Jesus' prayer is even more uh, uh, poignant. The prayer concludes in 24 to 26 of chapter 17. Jesus wishes that the disciples would see the glory God has given Jesus. Does this glory refer to the resurrection or Jesus' glory in heaven? Whatever the glory is from before the foundation or formation, the foundation of the world, is a glory given because the Father loves Jesus. The world cannot understand this glory. God is addressed as righteous again, the character of God. The world does not know God, but Jesus does. The disciples know Jesus. This knowledge of God is given to Jesus and also resides in the Johannine community. Now, the question, of course, this also leads to is, what does this say about, quote, unquote, individual salvation? Is Christian faith personal but lived out in community? The purpose of the prayer is summarized in 1726. Jesus has made the Father's name known to the disciples. Note how Moses also makes God's name, Yahweh, known to the people of Israel in Exodus 3. So Jesus makes the name of God's name known. With the name is the character and righteousness of a holy God. The character of the character of a holy and the holiness and righteousness of God. The purpose is that the love of God, the love which God loved Jesus to be among the people. Jesus lives in the community. The claims are then of the Johannine Jesus are transferred to the community, and then the Johannine community rests in God's love and character. This is, the, in the Johannine community, rests God's love and character. This is a very bold statement. For next time, how is the betrayal described? Where is the location of the garden? Does Judas touch Jesus? How does Jesus confront those arresting him? What is the significance of 1816? What do we learn about that disciple? What is the significance that Peter stands with those warming themselves in 1818? How does the description of the trial before the high priest correspond to synoptic accounts? Look especially at Mark 14. Who really is on trial in 1828 to 38? What irony do you see in 1828? What is the significance of 1832? And what is the irony of 1838? When does the scourging of Jesus occur in John? In 1903. In other words, what are the events? Who has the authority to crucify Jesus? At what time does Jesus' crucifixion take place? What is the irony of 1915? What is the hidden significance of the charge against Jesus? In 1916b to 22. Who are the witnesses of Jesus' crucifixion? How does this describe to uh, the synoptic uh, description? How do Jesus' last words in John 19:30 correspond to those of Mark and Matthew? What scripture is fulfilled in 1936, and what was its original context? And how is Jesus' body prepared in 1938 to 42, and when is it prepared, and who does the action? Thank you for your time.